Hello and welcome to the Walt Whitman Studies Association's ALA panel for 2021. I'd like to begin by thanking Ed Folsom and the Whitman Studies Association for sponsoring our panel this year. Mary Mullins and I have been working on this since the before times when we first started talking about this topic at a conference at the Walt Whitman Birthplace and Museum. And I know that many of you have been thinking about Whitman and women for many years. Today, we have a wide range of topics. And I think that these are exciting papers that promise a lot of excellent scholarship on Whitman and women in coming years as well. We will be starting today with Greg Eisline from Kansas State University, then Bradley Nelson from the CUNY Graduate Center, Karen Carpenter from NYU, Mary Mullins from Pepperdine, and then Kenneth M. Price from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. My name is Catherine Waitinas. I'm from Cal Poly State University, and I work on Whitman primarily um, via mesmerism and history of theater and other 19th century performance culture. I also have done some work on Whitman pedagogy studies, including how to teach Whitman with digital humanities, and I am so thrilled to be with you all today. So I'll pass it over now to Greg, Greg, again, is from Kansas State University, and he is a professor of English and a university distinguished teaching scholar there. His publications include an edition of Ada Isaacs Mencken's writings and an edition of Emma Lazarus's poetry and prose. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. The, the study I'm interested in is large. Whitman, as a nodal point within the vast history of Jewish writing, stretching back to the Tanakh, and forward to the 2020s. It would track the Jewish pathways that inspired Leaves of Grass and the lines of influence that shaped Jewish writing after Whitman. This is not gonna happen in eight minutes, but I wanted to sketch what it might look like and then highlight two nodes in this network, two 19th century Jewish women poets. The Hebrew poetic tradition inspired Whitman's development of free verse, as we know, an influence that traveled through the King James Version's attempt to capture the cadences and the parallelisms of Hebrew verse. More importantly, I think, Whitman loved the grandeur and power of Hebrew poetry, what he calls the religious fire and abandon of Isaiah in Democratic Vistas. There were also contemporary Jew Jewish influences, though I only have time to mention one here, the feminist reformer Ernestine Rose, whose radical politics and stirring rhetoric captured Whitman's attention in the 1850s. As Sherry Seniza has documented well, Rose and Whitman shared a passion for revolutionary language and for women's equality, and her work had an enduring impact on Whitman's writing. Whitman's work then had an enormous influence on the Jewish poetic tradition. Whitman's connection to Allen Ginsberg's been covered, but I'm not sure that's as true for a lot of other Jewish writers. Despite some great work by Julian Levinson and the Israeli poet Dara Barnett, there is still so much more to map, including Whitman's influence on a host of 20th century and 21st century American Jewish women writers, from Gertrude Stein to Muriel Rukeyser to the beat era work of Elise Cowan and the German-born Ruth Weiss to recent greats such as Adrian Rich and Jory Graham. But before the study gets ahead of itself, it should examine Whitman's earliest influences on Jewish poetry and track how he inspired the poetic choices, themes, and forms of poets like Mencken and Lazarus. Mencken is the first poet, Jewish or Gentile, male or female, to travel the path created by the poetic revolution Whitman initiated. We can hear his influence in Minkin's use of anaphora, cataloging lists, and apostrophic address. In terms of rhythms, however, Minkin's line usually sounds more like Ossian, and she doesn't use alliteration and assonance in the way Whitman does. A study like this that I'm imagining would strive to be specific about how exactly Whitman's free verse techniques affected the Jewish poets who learned from him. The study would also reveal important thematic distinctions. Both Whitman and Minkin, for example, worry about the terrible doubt of appearances, uh, acknowledging that we may be deluded by surfaces or representations of the self that aren't real. Whitman says, I'm not what you supposed, but far different. Minkin too thinks of the world as a place where to seem was to be, where living is but to play a part. 
as most of you know, Minkin was an actress and she used her free verse poems to describe the anguish she felt on stage and off stage as a celebrity, trying to perform the identity she was not. For Whitman, the doubts uh, about the true self often resolve themselves, in the Calamus poems at least, by holding hands, loving comrades, walking arm in arm, sleeping with a lover, hugging, kissing. For instance, the speaker of Whitman's A Glimpse finds happiness in a crowded bar room sitting next to his lover. But neither Minkin nor her persona ever found the same contentment among the New York Bohemians who congregated at Pfaff's beer, beer cellar. Yet it's at Pfaff's where Minkin and Whitman exchanged their ideas about poetry in life. For example, in an essay for the Sunday Mercury written in this period, Minkin depicts Whitman as a cultural hero who swims against the stream with a message ahead of his time and as a prophet who, who quote, hears the divine voice. Whitman, the individual, is for Minkin similar to Israel, the nation, which has swam against the current for 30 centuries, inspired by the radiant sun of divine truth, end quote. Minkin admires Whitman in this essay because he's a revolutionary, a rebel, which is what Whitman admired about Rose and what Lazarus would celebrate in her Jewish historical poems, such as Bar Kokhba. In addition to her revolutionary poems, as most of you probably know, Lazarus produced a large and varied body of work that was as likely to be inspired by ancient Hebrew scripture as French modernism as about a million things in between. Hence, Whitman's formal influence on Lazarus is just one of many, but it can be seen distinctly, I would argue. For instance, in her By the Waters of Babylon cluster, resembles the arrangements in the third edition of Leaves of Grass, where Whitman put the poems into clusters for the first time, and he numbered the poems within clusters, and he numbered the stanzas or verses within poems. In both instances, Whitman and Lazarus are alluding to the chapter and verse arrangements that editors use to divide and organize biblical texts. Where Whitman's influence is most visible, however, in Lazarus's work is not in the arrangement or the line or the sonic patterns, but in what I would call a shared vision of the U.S. as a place that could, if it lived up to its ideals, be inclusive and celebrate multitudes. We see this vision perhaps most famously in the New Colossus, where the mother of exiles welcomes the homeless, the tired and poor from across the globe to the U.S., where they will be able to breathe free. We also see it in poems like In Exile, where Lazarus celebrates in a Whitman-esque way the Russian-born Jewish Texans who see their lives now as, quote, an unbroken paradise because they have freedom to love the law that Moses brought. It's a vision that includes the Creole South, the brave dead soldiers of the Civil War, Miwok cosmology, and a lot more. She doesn't present Jewish identity as something to be blended into an American melting pot however. Lazarus tends to see America as an interesting but late event within the much broader Jewish history. But she does envision the U.S. as a place where, quote, the ancient barriers of race or creed or rank shall eventually crumble. Many of us are deeply pained by the gulf between Lazarus's vision of an inclusive America and its actual racist immigrant-hating history. Still, an important part of Lazarus's work is about imagining an inclusive new world where, quote, the old hatreds between heart and heart give way to an America that welcomes the impoverished and the persecuted. Lazarus's take on U.S. literary history is also, I would argue, a tad more aspirational than descriptive. While I don't have time to do justice to uh, Lazarus's take on U.S. literature right here, I can tell you it was more inclusive than most 19th century views, and it foregrounded Walt Whitman. Lazarus never met Whitman, but we know that they read and admired each other's work. Uh, they also shared a best friend, uh, the literary naturalist John Burroughs. In an exchange of letters in 1885, Burroughs uses the literary critical language popularized by Matthew Arnold to try out an interpretation of Whitman as a contemporary manifestation of Hellenism. Burroughs writes, Whitman's great manner seems to me thoroughly classical. 
Lazarus did not see Whitman's poetry that way at all. And she corrects his fumbling view. Burroughs' next letter offers a retraction and a clarification. Yes, Whitman is Hebraic. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Okay, our next speaker is Bradley Nelson. Bradley is a doctoral student in English at the CUNY Graduate Center. He's currently an adjunct at the CUNY School for Professional Studies and has taught English literature and composition at City College and Brooklyn College. Currently at work on his dissertation entitled, As Blind Men Learn the Sun, Towards a Poetics of Queer Mysticism in U.S. Literature. His research interests include 19th and 20th century U.S. poetry, medieval mysticism, queer theory, philosophy, and the digital humanities. Thank you, Bradley. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, my, my paper today is called Walt Whitman, Gertrude Stein, and the Queer Poetics of Naming Around. Um, okay, and it's sort of a crash course into thinking that I've been doing on this topic of queer mysticism. Um, and it treats Walt Whitman as a kind of uh, master precursor to this concept. So crash course it is. I hope it's not too incoherent to due to brevity, but um, if you have any questions, let me know. Okay. In the lecture of poetry and grammar, Gertrude Stein claims that somewhere along the line, poetry had exhausted its passion for simply naming things. Stein's example of such exhaustion is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who Stein finds to be formally brilliant, but emotionally dispassionate. In Stein's estimation, a new practice of writing poetry needed to emerge to break this logjam. She names its vanguard Walt Whitman. Today, I would like to take a look at this meaning of the mind. I argue that this practice of passionately naming around a thing is a mystical practice, one that I will trace back to Pseudo Dionysius, a sixth century Syrian theologian whose negative theology provided a foundation for late medieval Christian mysticism. According to Dionysius, God is a hidden transcendent God. And so our words about him, can, him or the divine can only name around it. While it is acceptable to use language to make an attempt at describing the divine, we must bear in mind that because our knowledge is limited, earthly metaphors must be shunned. I argue that Stein, following Whitman, wants to do something similar, and that this influence suggests a legacy of queer mysticism that exists throughout 19th and early 20th century poetry. So in poetry and grammar, Stein provides a few simple definition on which to build her poetics. And this is after she had gone through a kind of Steinian, um, the grammar part of the lecture is, is her saying, I like, I, I hate nouns because of this. They don't do this. I love adverbs. I love that it is very, you know, it's this kind of late lecture. So that that's sort of the background to it. But um, in the second half of the lecture, she talks about poetry and she gives a definition as such. Quote, poetry is the discovery, the love, the passion for the name of anything. And she defines the act of poetry as, quote, the creating something without naming it. In the lecture, Stein identifies Whitman as a direct inspiration for her own uh, first initiation into poetry, which is her 1914 collection, Tender Buttons a text that displays an extreme ambivalence towards letting nouns be what they are. To understand this influence, it may be, quote, it may be helpful to quote poetry and grammar at length. Quote, and then Walt Whitman came. He wanted, really wanted to express the thing and not call it by its name. He worked very hard at that and he called it leaves of grass because he wanted, to, wanted it to be as little a well-known name to be called upon passionately as possible. I do not know at all, I, I do not at all know whether Whitman knew that he wanted to do this, but there is no doubt at all, but that this is what he did want to do. And this is where that slide would have been helpful because it's difficult to Stein's difficult to read out loud. Anyway, Stein admires Whitman's ability to create a thing in words and not call it by its name. 
She doesn't want to go on listing nouns over and over, which is, of course, the old poetry, um, because they don't have a life of their own. She wants to name around things passionately, as all women did. This action of naming around has precedence in, precedent in Pseudo Dionysius, whose divine names attempt to address a problem that exists in exegetical writing. It often took the form of uh, an, an exegete hovering over a single word or phrase found in, in biblical uh, corners, obscure corners of biblical literature. Um, it was therefore necessary for Dionysius to explain particular words as they emerged in biblical commentary. So in the divine names, Dionysius takes a negative, makes, makes the negative theological point that due to the limitations of earthly language, our names for the divine do not work. It follows that theological concepts such as being, life, and wisdom are limited as well. Through a process that he called yearning or desire, we can speak divine names, but our words are subservient to a super abundant source that overflows and gives these names the reality. The Neoplatonic one is the name that gives all individual things their name. So if Stein, following Whitman, wants to employ a similar practice, then we can consider Tender Buttons a kind of modern divine name. It is, as Stein says in her lecture, no longer drunk with nouns. Instead, her poetry names around the things it intends to describe. The first section of Tender Buttons is called Objects, and it announces its aim. Quote, what is the use of a violent kind of delightfulness if there is no pleasure in not getting tired of it? This rhetorical question provides an insight into a rather perplexing series of poems. Stein pauses, or to use a more Steinian idiom, rests on each object until it seems to lose its meaning. But her, co her poems go beyond simply naming objects. They demonstrate a desire to reach at something beyond the object itself. To take one example from the second section, um, this section is called food. Stein emphasizes the magical quality contained in, this, in doing this naming around. Due to the active process of cooking, Stein finds a magical verbal component in food objects and therefore their name. The section begins with a poem called Roast Beef, a food object that was a staple in the Stein Tuchlick household. This food object is important because it allows Stein to test her reflection on something that has been transformed. Her description begins, quote, in the inside there is sleeping, in the outside there is reddening, in the morning there is meaning, in the evening there is feeling. Roast beef, as the cooks listening today would know, needs to rest in order to get to a certain condition inside. As Toklas would have known, resting meat creates a condition of tenderness that remains imprisoned in the roast beef itself. And later in the poem, she um, uses this image of the prison as imprisonment as kind of tender imprisonment, which is a kind of perplexing image, but that's sort of how it, how it uh, goes. So on its way from a dead slab of meat to tender roast beef, it is served, eaten, and digested, and therefore transformed. So in Tender Buttons as a whole, Stein wants to feel her way through the name of an object and discover its active principle that overflows and forces its way out. Following Dionysius, this naming is a mystical practice because it emerges not from a transcendent outside, but from imminently inside the thing itself. Here, we may wish to connect this desire to name around back to Whitman. And for this, we have numerous points of entry. Speaking very roundly is not the entirety of Lisa's graph, one long list of active objects filtered through a Whitmanian eye. But I'd like to conclude today with what, for me, a writer who's trying to find out what is queer about all this is the most evocative naming around in all of Whitman. That is the enigmatic Live Oak with Moss. A poem that begins with a series of negative statements ends with an ode to a young man a student whose mind the speaker wishes to move. 
this student who could have been a stand-in for Fred Vaughn or a composite of all of the men Whitman loved during his life was, as Stein might put it, a creation without a name. This poetics of naming around reaches even further to late medieval mystics such as John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, which my dissertation talks about elsewhere. But for today, I would like to propose that this mystical quality connects Stein and Whitman, two poets whose work screams its queerness, however softly, and it's found in this action of naming around. I look forward to our discussion today, and I welcome your suggestions for further points of entry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bradley. Terrific. Okay, our next speaker is Karen Carboner. Karen Carboner teaches at New York University and is president and founding member of the Walt Whitman Initiative, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to cultural activism. Winner of the Klug Fellowship at the Library of Congress and a Fulbright recipient, she has published widely on Whitman, including Leaves of Grass, First and Deathbed Editions, two audiobooks on Whitman's life and influence, a children's book introducing Whitman to young readers, and a collaboration with illustrator Brian Selznick on a new edition of Live Oak with Moss. She has curated several Whitman-based exhibitions, including Poet of the Body, New York's Walt Whitman, and an exhibition at New York's Groyer Club, co-curated by collector Susan Tain, with catalog published by the Grolier Club, and she is an active public scholar in her hometown, New York City. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thanks for everybody for tuning in and to this great panel that I'm part of. Uh, during his years writing and publishing the first three editions of Leaves of Grass, Whitman cultivated relationships with many notable women of his day change-making figures in the women's rights movement, including Fanny Fern, Ernestine Rose, who we've just heard about, and Abby Hill's Price were both friends and supporters. We typically understand the female reaction to Whitman through su such women who had reason to be sympathetic to the poet and his writings. But what did the female common reader, the same work woman of these states whom he directly addresses in Leaves of Grass, think of Whitman? Two curious objects enable the beginnings of a response. An 1856 book by an author presenting herself as Katinka and featuring a Song of Myself quotation as a preface, and a circa 1856 daguerreotype of an unknown woman holding a copy of the second edition of Leaves of Grass. And I'm just gonna bring you all over here to take a look at the cover of Katinka there. Abby Knott and Other Knots, a book of character sketches, some of which bear resemblance to Whitman and even utilize some of his word choices, offers a preface composed solely of these lines from the poem eventually titled uh, Song of Myself. I do not trouble my spirit to vindicate itself or be understood. I see that the elementary laws never apologize. I reckon I behave no prouder than the level I plant my house by after all. And then Walt Whitman. Um, the copyright date of the book, April 5th, 1856, is less than 10 months later than the publication of the first edition and five months before Whitman released Leaves of Grass, 1856. In allowing Whitman's words to introduce her stories, author Catherine Brooks Yale contributes the first published support of the poet by a woman. And in case you're wondering, Fanny Fern's review of Leaves of Grass was published on May 10th, 1856 in the New York Ledger. Though Yale's book includes numerous quotations and references to other writers, Bryant, Carlyle, Emerson, Wordsworth, Thoreau, Longfellow, and so on, Whitman's lines provide a particularly fierce individualistic introduction to her stories and a motivation for giving special attention to her descriptions of tradition-defying women and idealistic poets. Indeed, the quotation from the already controversial Whitman, as well as mention of such topics as, quote, the abolition of slavery, women's rights, and the dignity of labor in Abbey Knot and Other Knots, may explain why Yale, described as beautiful and delicate in her obituary, published under a pseudonym. Abby Knott and Other Knots received a single known review in an abbreviated paragraph in the 17th May 1856 edition, the Home Journal took note of the author's fiery spirit, but also her lack of substance. 
Yale had written for the family magazine in the 1840s, where she had become acquainted with its editor, Nathaniel Parker Willis, and possibly his sister, Sarah, better known as Fanny Fern. There is in fact mention of Fanny Fern in Abbey Knot and other knots. Little Ferns for Fanny's little friends is enjoyed by children who lisp their admiration of Fanny Fern on page 212. Abby Knott was by far the boldest book published by Yale, who also penned a children's book, Nim and Come and the Wonderhead Stories in 1895, and a pamphlet narrating the story of the old Willard House of Deerfield, Massachusetts, that came out in 1887, where she lived her last years. Her obituary in the Springfield, Massachusetts Republican of March 25, 1900s, notes the achievements of her husband, Linus Yale, a very remarkable man, an inventor of the Yale lock. Though Catherine too had quote, unusual talents and quote, might have easily been a figure in American literature, she quote, had sent out to the reading world no evidence of her ability besides her two signed productions. Nevertheless, this so-called sometime writer had Emerson read at her funeral, such things as Mrs. Yale herself was ever quoting and included lines from Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking in the history of her home. Catherine Brooks Yale, as well as any mid-century middle-class woman, may have been the sitter uh, holding the second edition of Leaves of Grass in a circa 1856 daguerreotype. The photograph surfaced in a 1999 auction and was purchased by its current owner, Donald Lewis Osborne, for $37. In his article for the Daguerrean Annual in 2000, Osborne describes the image as, quote, unattributed and muses, is the lady holding her chest purchased 1855, he got it wrong, it's the 1856 edition of Leaves of Grass, or is it a studio prop? Tim Pattison, senior book conservator at the Northeast Document Conservation Center and an expert on mid 19th century cloth publishers bindings assured me that he is quote almost certain that she bought the brought the book with her to the sitting with the express purpose of having her image taken with the volume. Pattison who collects and studies daguerreotypes that feature books in personal portraits also noted that the sitter's hands quote are placed so as to frame the title where a more natural way of holding the book would probably obscure at least part of the gold lettering on the front. Though Pattison's collection includes other daguerreotypes with subjects holding identifiable books, and I put up some on the screen for you there, neither he nor Ed Folsom has seen another image, including Leaves of Grass, until near the end of the 19th century. Considered the earliest photograph of Leaves of Grass and the only known image of the book taken during Whitman's lifetime, this important daguerreotype remains an object of mystery, featuring an, an unknown subject and lacking props or identifiers to help determine the photographer or studio. This remarkable person chose to identify herself through Whitman's remarkable book. The portrait has two points of interest, her face and leaves of grass. The viewer's eye is drawn up and down, connecting her gaze with the text and her mind with her body, in particular, her lower torso. She holds the book as confidently as she looks into the camera. Perhaps the book is upside down to the viewer because it serves as a sort of a mirror, looking up at her as she looks down at it. As Ed Folsom noted, quote, the 1856 edition has been described as Whitman's women's rights edition. The second poem after Poem of Walt Whitman and American is Poem of Women, later unfolded out of the folds, which removes Victorian mores and garments to reveal women's genitalia on the page. Poem of Procreation celebrates sex and, na and as, as natural and desirable for women as well as men. The sitter's position of, on, of the book on her lap and the bemused smile on her face, by no means easy to hold during the 60 or more seconds she must have held it still to create this image, suggests her knowledge and support of Whitman's idea of Leaves of Grass as a woman's book. Wearing dress, quote, conventional and correct for a secure middle-class young lady, that's from Margaret Guardi, who's a clothing expert at the Walt Whitman birthplace, and yet unafraid to draw attention to her ringless fingers and her crotch, 
she strikes the viewer as traditional with a twist, proper but not quite. Both Yale and the unknown sitter were conventional, uh, conventional enough to fade into history and may even have wanted to do so. And yet they are both exceptional for our purposes. They are indicators that Walt Whitman found very early approval with a female common readership. In fact, they suggest that Whitman's earliest fans may well have been women, not famous writers or artists or activists, but middle-class cultivated women who managed to gain access to Leaves of Grass shortly after its first appearance and after the publication of comparatively few and very mixed reviews. An effect that these two objects may have had is of normalizing Whitman, of showing that Leaves of Grass did not just celebrate but actually represented his idea of, quote, the divine average. It's one thing to have Fanny Fern tell you to read the book, another for your sister or neighbor to show their support, as social media has taught us. The idea of a Whitmanian groundswell that may not have been reported or detected by the press, but nevertheless shaped his reception, seems a possibility, particularly with populations that were underrepresented by mainstream media. I thus propose a reassessment of Whitman's reception history through other means than our usual consultation of published book reviews and correspondence. A call to action first initiated by Sherry Siniza in a 1995 essay for the Cambridge Companion to Walt Whitman. Let's expand Sherry's request for a closer examination of, quote, the women whose names and addresses appear in Whitman's notebooks, and quote, the women whom Whitman quotes in his notebooks, to a female record that is not just verbal, but material. Book plates and ownership records, photographs and diaries, records of women's lending libraries, advertisements and articles in such women's and family magazines as Nathaniel Parker Willis's home journal. As Whitman noted of every woman, like Katinka and the anonymous sitter, it was in them to do actions as grand, to say as beautiful thoughts, to set examples for their race. But in each one, the book was not opened. It lay in its place ready. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Karen. Our next speaker is Mary Mullins who is professor of English at Pepperdine University. Mary has also, in addition to presenting this paper today, been a huge part of planning this panel. So I'd like to thank her again. Her publications include an edited edition of Hannah Whitman Hyde's Complete Correspondence, which is forthcoming in December from Bucknell, and essays on Whitman in Whitman in Context, a companion to Walt Whitman, the Walt Whitman Encyclopedia, and the Walt Whitman Quarterly Review. Thanks, Mary. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I wanna say what an honor it is for me to be on this panel um, and uh, to share my work with all of you today. So thank you to all of you. Um, oh, okay, I wanna start with this slide. Uh, this is um, my title. And uh, I just, I, I'm looking at Louisa May Alcott and Walt Whitman uh, during 1863, when they both wrote accounts of their experiences with wounded and dying soldiers in the Civil War hospitals. Alcott created a loosely fictionalized narrative, Hospital Sketches, featuring a character named Tribulation Periwinkle, who worked as a nurse in the Union Hotel Hospital. Whitman wrote notebook entries, published journalistic prose pieces about his experiences in the hospitals, and began writing the poems of drum taps. Alcott's publishing success with hospital sketches caught Whitman's interest and served as the impetus for one of his Civil War writing projects, Memoranda of a Year. While critical studies have acknowledged the broader connections between Alcott's hospital sketches and Whitman's Civil War writing, the extent of Alcott's influence on Whitman has not been fully examined. Alcott's publishing success with hospital sketches in the fall of 1863 demonstrated to Whitman that an audience for writing about the wounded soldiers in the Civil War hospitals existed. Her descriptions of the suffering and trauma of the enlisted soldiers under her care <clears throat> and her accounts of the close relationships she developed with them provided models for Whitman of how to capture the war in writing. Trauma <clears throat> and traumatic stress have only recently, within the last few decades, been studied and understood by mental health professionals. 
Indeed, it could be argued that both Alcott and Whitman suffered from what is now called secondary trauma because of the sheer amount of vicarious trauma that they witnessed, now known as compassion fatigue. The most widely known definition of trauma is that formulated by K.T. Erickson in 1976 as a blow to the psyche that breaks through one's defenses so suddenly and with such brutal force that one cannot re react to it effectively. Soldiers who served in combat during wartime often suffer from PTSD. The American Psychiatric Association defines PTSD as a psychiatric disorder that may occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a traumatic event. One of the symptoms of PTSD is intrusion, intrusive thoughts such as repeated involuntary memories, distressing dreams, or flashbacks of the traumatic event. Flashbacks may be so vivid that people feel they are reliving the traumatic experience or seeing it before their eyes. According to recent studies in the general population, PTSD affects about 5% of men and 10% of women. There is, of course, no way of knowing how many veterans suffered from PTSD during and after the Civil War, but it is remarkable that both Alcott and Whitman included in their Civil War writing vivid accounts of this specific kind of trauma more than 100 years before it was more clearly understood by the medical profession. One of the poems that Whitman included in Drum Taps, The Artilleryman's Vision, is remarkably similar to Alcott's description in hospital sketches of a New Jersey boy crazed by the horrors of that dreadful Saturday, that is December 13th, the midpoint of the Battle of Fredericksburg. His mind had suffered more than his body, Alcott writes, and for days he had been reliving in his imagination the scenes he could not forget till his distress broke out in incoherent ravings, pitiful to hear. As I sat by him, endeavoring to soothe his poor distracted brain by the constant touch of wet hands over his hot forehead, he lay cheering his comrades on, hurrying them back, then counting them as they fell around him, often clutching my arm to drag me from the vicinity of a bursting shell. His eyes restless, his head never still, every muscle strained and rigid, while an incessant stream of defiant shouts, whispered warnings, and broken laments poured from his lips with that forceful bewilderment which makes such wanderings so hard to overhear. The soldier that Nurse Periwinkle is describing experiences classic symptoms of post-traumatic stress in the days following the battle. Unable to comfort him, aside from the constant touch that her wet hands provide and her compassionate presence, she helplessly looks on while he relives the nightmare of battle. Alcott's sketch may have resonated with Whitman as he was crafting The Artilleryman's Vision, a poem based on entries from Whitman's notebook of 1862 and 1863. Told in the first person point of view by a Civil War veteran haunted by nightly visions of being at the battlefront, the speaker remembers these scenes years later when the wars are over long. This time lapse is very much in keeping with the criteria that the APA lists on its website for a diagnosis of PTSD. Symptoms may appear later and often persist for months and sometimes years, they write. In this poem, Whitman draws a dramatic contrast between the speaker's wife, who at my side lies slumbering peacefully unaware, and the nightly trauma the veteran experiences, powerless in the grip of recurring dreams. The sense of sound is foregrounded, since sight was often obscured by smoke and the chaos of movement common to ground warfare. Whitman writes, I hear the irregular snap, snap. I hear the sounds of the different missiles, the short tch, tch of the rifle balls. I see the shells exploding, leaving small white clouds. I hear the great shells shrieking as they pass, the grape-like, the hum and whir of wind through the trees. All the scenes at the batteries rise in detail before me again. Nurse Periwinkle describes how she is physically dragged into the battle scenes that the wounded soldier is reliving through his imagination, while Whitman's narrator describes the quietly sleeping spouse unaware of her husband's battlefield, battlefield nightmares. Alcott's prose description captures post-traumatic stress, whereas Whitman's poem captures post-traumatic stress disorder. The difference between the two is the difference in time. Alcott's soldier experiences traumatic memories just a few days after the battles he has endured. 
Whitman's soldier experiences distressing dreams in the form of vivid flashbacks that begin in a specific battle and then widen toward the end of the poem to include memories of a never ending war experience. Therapeutic treatment for these soldiers would not have been available, but the traumatized soldiers that Alcott and Whitman describe differ in the way they seek or do not seek help. Alcott's soldier, unaware of his surroundings, thinks that Nurse Periwinkle is a fellow combatant and tries to drag her to safety. While she listens, she finds his experience so hard to overhear. Whitman's combatant contrasts the quiet breath of my infant in the darkness to the harsh sounds of the skirmishers, the missiles, the shells, and the grape. Neither soldier veteran is cognizant of comfort from others, yet the suffering they endure is witnessed. And in that witnessing, a deeper understanding of the war emerges. How can a writer convey that which defies expression? How give voice to unutterable events? Ken Price asks in his introduction to Memoranda During the War. Both Alcott and Whitman had faced this challenge in writing about the war. Alcott's convalescence gave her distance and perspective about her experience. As no two persons see the same thing with the same eyes, my view of hospital life must be taken through my glass and held for what it is worth, Alcott writes. Because of their experiences, Whitman and Alcott knew that the battlefield did not adequately capture all that the Civil War signified. The hospitals were much more resonant. The expression of American personality through this war is not to be looked for in the great campaign and the battlefields. It is to be looked for in the hospitals among the wounded, Whitman writes. Alcott's use of the sketch genre, her descriptions of the wounded soldiers under her care, and her experiences in the hospitals prefigure Whitman's approach. Although Whitman's Civil War writing differed in many ways from Alcott's, Hospital sketches served as an important precursor, helping Whitman to better understand his role in the hospitals, providing him with a model for the shaping of his material into a longer prose narrative about the war, and demonstrating that a receptive audience for accounts of Civil War hospital life existed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Our final speaker today is Kenneth M. Price. He is a Hillegas University professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and he has co-directed the Walt Whitman Archive since 1995. At Nebraska, he also co-directs the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities. He has edited books on literary studies in the digital age, James Weldon Johnson, George Santayana, and 19th century periodical literature. But he is best known as a Whitman scholar. He is the author of Whitman in Tradition, The Poet in His Century, To Walt Whitman America, and co-author with Ed Folsom of Rescripting Walt Whitman. His latest book, Whitman in Washington, Becoming the National Poet in the Federal City, was published by Oxford UP in 2020. Thanks, Ken. Thank you for that nice introduction. Great to be here with all of you. I've enjoyed the talks very much. Whitman's Civil War landscapes are ambiguous, recurrently marked by destruction and debris, swamps and scorched earth, and they highlight moral uncertainties and quandaries. The messiness, misunderstandings, and challenges facing any effort to recuperate the past with its history of exploitation characterize his Ethiopia Saluting the Colors, a poem composed in 1867, though not published until 1871. On a variety of grounds, this poem has made many white critics since then cringe. But it was praised by Langston Hughes as, quote, one of the most beautiful poems in our language concerning a Negro subject. And other Black artists, including the poet Melvin Tolson and the composers Samuel Coleridge Taylor and H.T. Burley have revered it as well. Ed Folsom has argued that it has always seemed that African-American writers and critics see and hear something in the poem that most white readers do not. If in fact the poem is seen and heard differently along racial lines, it may be because of the differing ways two key terms, Ethiopia and Sherman can be understood. <clears throat> the soldier in the poem baldly states what many Europeans and white Americans believed. People from Africa, like the elderly woman he observes were 
quote, hardly human. Whitman's various comments on Ethiopia in both private drafts and published writings are far more complex. He described Ethiopia as the bedrock foundation of civilization, a key precursor, if nonetheless primitive in outlook. In the 1860 to 1861 poem, eventually titled Song of the Broad Axe, Whitman mentions the, quote, venerable and harmless men of Ethiopia. Even this limited praise of Ethiopia led to parodic treatment of his views in pro-slavery publications and in Vanity Fair. In the US, views of Ethiopia in the 1860s and 1870s could fall anywhere on the spectrum from those who mocked Whitman's comments about that land's venerable and harmless men to those who held that Ethiopia was a land, quote, favored by the gods and that Ethiopians were, quote, closest to the gods. This latter line of thinking available in classical dictionaries and possibly through oral tradition too would resonate for African-Americans. Also important for African-Americans were General William Tecumseh Sherman and his ill-fated effort to set aside land for African-Americans. As a post-war reflection on the conflict and its implications, this poem is controversial because of its belated treatment of race. Whitman did not address slavery and emancipation in any meaningful way in the initial publication of Drum Taps, though he added this poem to the Drum Taps cluster of Leaves of Grass in 1881. Whitman's dramatization of an encounter between an elderly black woman and a soldier joined many other verbal and visual treatments in the Northern press of African-American women and children, children encountering federal troops. As early as 1862, for example, Harper's Weekly depicted an African-American woman and her children greeting Union soldiers in which it offered a mocking rendering of black dialect. Ostensibly seeking freedom, the caricatured woman behind three thick horizontal bars appears far from emancipation. The image offers no sign of blacks and whites sharing the same space. The woman's smiling face, open arms and widely spread legs distance her from ideals of white bourgeois womanhood, of course, and the fencing suggests that firm barriers are in place to block any efforts to escape, something her dialect signals too. Whitman's own imagining of the interaction between an African-American woman and Sherman's army was almost certainly shaped by such depictions in the popular press. To take another example of this theme, an unknown artist in Harper's Weekly caricatured an open mouthed slave along with the purported comment, is all damn Yankees that's passing? <clears throat> the African-American woman appears stunned and possibly alarmed. There's a discrepancy between the text and image here that was fairly typical as Harper's writers were often more sympathetic than illustrators who came from a tradition of caricature and satire. In the picture, a porch railing leaves the woman fenced in and limited black mobility is also emphasized in the caption describing her as quote, one of the colored population who watched from the plantation from which probably she was never 10 miles in her life. However, the plantation setting in which she theatrically addresses an offstage mistress or master suggests some agency, though it is tied to the movements of all damn marching soldiers. Indeed, the viewer following her gaze is in on the joke. The endless number of Yankees is precisely what the slave's seeming astonishment underscores. The prospect is of her master's defeat. In contrast, Whitman's elderly woman, Ethiopia, though she may seem a caricature too, differs importantly from popular depictions of enslaved women. She has both self-awareness and agency and her evident understanding not only of the significance of the Northern invasion and its implications for her freedom is matched by her refusal to disavow her African roots. She's not shocked or overwhelmed by the prospect of freedom, nor is she caught between staying put and crossing over to the Union Army we see her seizing her own emancipation. Like the popular illustrations, Whitman's poem employs black dialect, but instead of using it as a comic mode, Whitman employs it to satirize white Southern pastoral. Me master years a hundred since from my parents sundered a little child, they caught me as the savage beast is caught. 
Then hither me across the sea, the cruel slaver brought. Whitman's language rings false because of the later achievements of Dunbar, Chestnut, Hughes, Faulkner, Morrison, and other artists who've highlighted the range and eloquence of black dialect. The problem in Ethiopia saluting the colors is not that Whitman has presented African-American speech as a barbarous deviation from a norm, but that he failed to recognize the extraordinary expressive capacity of black dialect when rendered realistically. Whitman and the popular press exhibit different types of failures of authenticity. The diction Whitman attributes to the elderly woman is overly poeticized with its inversions, two instances of internal rhyme and a chiasmic heroic simile, caught me as the savage beast is an inversion that speaks back to and disputes the Northern soldier's claim that she is hardly human. We only need to separate author from narrator to see that Whitman's depiction of white racism is not an endorsement of it. The elderly woman resists dehumanizing interpretations, indignities, and deprivations that one of Sherman's soldiers shows little, little eagerness to correct. Tis while our army lines Carolina's sand and pines, forth from thy hovel door, thou, Ethiopia, comest to me, as under doughty Sherman I march toward the sea. What comes to mind through the naming of Sherman and what would resonate particularly for African-American readers is the possibility of an improved life precisely through the promise of land possession, land promise via Sherman's Field Order 15. In this Field Order of January 16, 1865, Sherman confiscated land abandoned by fleeing whites and gave African-Americans possessory rights to a strip of coastal land stretching from Charleston, South Carolina to Northern Florida, along with nearby sea islands after consulting with a group of black ministers. These orders redistributed roughly 400,000 acres of land and 40 acre segments to newly freed black families and are probably the origin of the 40 acres and a mule promise. Whitman no doubt read about this order in a variety of places, including in his government work and in the daily papers. Regrettably, this order was rescinded by the government not long after. The double dealing of the government may explain some of the oddities of the poem, including Ethiopia's initial greeting of the American flag as a sign of liberation. In the first stanza, Sherman soldier is more confused by her liberation than the elderly woman. So he asks, why rising by this roadside here, do you the colors greet? By the end of the poem, though the woman remains respectful, she curtsies to the regiments. She also goes silent, wagging her head with turban bound yellow, red, and green. She wears the colors of the Ethiopian flag, displaying pride in her African roots, even as she honors an American flag, strange and marvelous, that could both conceive of land redistribution and betray its promise. Thank you. Thank you. See, should I need to end screen, don't I? Yes. I can do that. So thank you all so much. I think these papers individually are fascinating and together are even more than the sum of their parts. Um, I think we can see that from the first paper through the last, we're dealing with this question of America, if it lives up to its promise. Every single one of these papers in some way is kind of um, considering how Whitman uses imagery and religion and you know language to address this notion of his universe the single poem but also america as the greatest poem both of which rely as he tells us on diversity right the, the universe is made up of the diverse um, so we've gone today from these ancient religious texts through our relationship in 2021 with poets from the 19th century, um, working our way from women who were literary celebrities to American common women holding on to Whitman's book to the enslaved woman of Ethiopia saluting the colors. And I have some questions that I'm curious about, but I'd like first to open it up to all of you, questions you might have for each other. Um, you can raise your hand or you can just jump in. There aren't very many of us, so I think we'll be okay if we can just jump in. Would anyone like to begin with a question? Mary, go for it. 
I have a question for Ken. Uh, very much enjoyed your paper. I love the images and uh, the close analysis of the poem. I have a question about the poem itself, though, and about the voice in the poem. I'm wondering, Ken, there, there are a, a series of questions, and then we have the, uh, the enslaved one, or freely, um, the free woman's um, comments there in italics, but then the last two stanzas, are those spoken by the soldier or by a speaker of the poem um, in your reading of the poem? Um, I would say they are spoken by the um, soldier. By the soldier. Well, okay. let, me look at let me look at that again. Um, I'm especially interested in that line. What is it, faithful woman, so blear, hardly human? Yeah. It's very disturbing. Well, right. It, and that's that's why the, the poem has been for so long hard to redeem. <laughs> hard to, you know, I, as I explained uh, when I gave this talk in another place, I, I don't teach it. And I, I long abhorred the poem. But then I, you know, saw that so many African-Americans found it to be a laudable poem. And so I thought, well, maybe I need to take their take on it seriously and try to understand what, what is redeemable about the poem. And then when I came upon Sherman's Field Order, it, it began to click that there were ways in which you could see the appeal of the poem. Um, I mean, the poem starts out with the um, Northern soldier speaking, then, then you get the Ethiopia speaking, and then you're asking about the final lines, and it's, you know, it's not really clear who the speaker is, whether it is, uh, goes back to the northern soldier or whether it is some disembodied voice. If it's a, some disembodied voice, you've got the, you know, the poet, maybe Whitman behind the poet, um, you know, then would be responsible for the hardly human line, but you also have uh, her wearing on her highborn turbaned head. Um, and that highborn, you know, both means it's high on the forehead, but it also, if you hear it, it highborn, she's also of high status, she's noble. Uh, and so you've got these conflicting views of her worth and essential nature. Yeah, and he's, he's troping Ethiopia in the poem as well, um, just, you know, as a metaphor for a place, but also for a person. It's just, uh, it's a fascinating poem in terms of the different kinds of voices that he's bringing in. And I just, um, I, I wanted to follow up with you about that. I, I've, I've taught Heart of Darkness many times and knowing, you know, that Africa at this time is, is very much unexplored, but I suppose Ethiopia would have been one of the only places that would have been known about at the time. So it, it's just a fascinating poem. Thank you for your analysis of it. Yeah, Maybe if I'll I could, make... oh, oh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead, Ken. Well, I, 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 yeah, go. A couple of follow up and then I won't hog all the time, I promise. Um, one interesting thing about Ethiopia is if you look at 19th century maps, sometimes the entire continent of Africa is called Ethiopia. Um, and then Ethiopia also had a reputation for being one part of Africa that was never successfully colonized. Uh, and so there's a, a fair amount of interesting background on um, Ethiopia as a country in uh, Ed Folsom's uh, great essay on Lucifer in Ethiopia. Uh, in that volume that David Reynolds uh, published many years ago. Uh, but if you haven't seen that piece, it's it's great for background on Ethiopia. Anyway. Yeah, I guess I wanted to jump in with, with Mary there and thank you, Ken, for that reintroduction to this poem, which I've struggled to teach also. And your attention also to the to Whitman's uh, lack of portraying black dialect realistically was really interesting considering how fascinated Whitman was with language, right? That he actually did not wind up thinking about black language, um, you know, despite the American primer and, and so forth. So, so something to, to look into, but I'm gonna redirect to 
Bradley. Bradley, I really loved your talk. Thank you so much. I've taught Stein too with Whitman, which is interesting. And just like a broad question, was was um, Stein's Whitman queer? Did she queer him? Um, not that I know of. I mean, I don't think that she acknowledged him as queer necessarily. Um, in that, is that is that what you? Yeah, just I, you know, because you were talking about um, her calling attention to not calling the thing by its name, right? Which mm -hmm. which Whitman does a lot when he's talking about homosexuality or homoerotic feelings, especially in Live Oak with Moss. So mm -hmm. I didn't know if she was sort of pointing that way or, you know, if she had a particular um, queer reading of Whitman or, you know, is she just yeah, I, I just didn't know if she queered him. That's all. Yeah, well, it's it. You know, I think I think that there's a way that you can say because she's impressed by his ability of creating something, um, creating something without naming it, and so that to me is sort of in following with queer theory this this idea of um, naming something in a kind of non-linear, non central sort of way. Um, I think that is, is the, the, the digressions in Whitman and the sort of meandering quality sometimes that Whitman takes, that is really interesting to Stein too, you know. But it's also kind of like connecting what Catherine was saying about the how everything connects with America, sort of like I guess Stein, because I was thinking, well, Stein, you know, lived in Paris and was was a quintessential expat, um, but she she kind of, and you know, becoming famous with the writing of the autobiography of Alice B. Copeless, it's sort of almost a burlesque of Americanism. And I wonder sometimes if, and this is just off the top of my head, it's like maybe that's one of her functions for a lot of her peers over in Europe is that she was this like ultra American, of course, Jewish woman. So maybe that, complicates that a little bit, but I wonder if that hyper-Americanism is something that, that could connect to, to Catherine's point about, about the kind of Americanness of all the papers, you know? Thank you. I'm thinking about the ways that both Mary <clears throat> and Ken write about trauma, you know, the trauma of being Black in America in the 19th century, the trauma of war and how most of Whitman's poetry is this first person persona, right? It's not exactly Whitman, but it's this Whitmanian self. Um, but that some of these trauma poems, like this Ethiopian um, representation of the soldier or um, let's say the wound dresser are, are a different speaker. And it strikes me that persona is something like acting. And so I was thinking, Greg, and this might tie into yours as well. Um, this tradition where we go back to Mencken as an actress and a, a, a tradition of maybe Jewish performance via poetry. Is this anything that, um, that works? Is this a way we might understand the Whitmanian voice a little bit through maybe a Jewish mystical tradition even? Um, prophecy, something like that. Is there some way we could use this to better understand the Whitmanian speaker? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think one of the important things is that Whitman's influence here isn't, it's just not one path, right? It's like a whole bunch of different paths. And I think one of them is theater and performance and performance of identity. Um, I was just thinking, I, I agree with Bradley intensely that, that there's something, um, uh, I don't know if it, it's intentionally a, a stereotype or a parody, but Gertrude Stein is like, super American-ish, right? She, she only comes back to the US like once in, after she goes to Paris at 29, but she writes about all the uh, kind of ordinariness of America, right? Uh, railway stations and five and dime um, stores and canteens and all this, uh, all the kind of uh, ordinary stuff that fills up America. And that seems very Whitman-esque to me that, that kind of, 
um, desire to catalog all the stuff that's ordinary. And I see that in Stein as, as well. Um, there, there's a, um, a number of Jewish writers that will acknowledge that, yeah, of course Whitman wasn't Jewish, but they sure wish he, he would have been, right? They want to claim him in some way because I think of this kind of prophetic voice. I mean, so K Catherine, yes, to all, uh, I, I saw three threads there. Yes to all three of them. I'll just jump, jump in here really quickly again because of this Whitmanian abundance. And Bradley, you talk about superabundance in Stein and Whitman. Um, and you know, Stein is so famous for being hard to read. And I thought it was great when you said it's really hard to read this Stein excerpt. Um, I think that's part of the superabundance, right? And so how, how do you negotiate that when writing um, the, the diversity as represented in superabundance, um, cataloging, you know, et cetera, this, this is part of the queerness as you see it? Um, yes, like the, the, the idea I think is that, um, so to contrast Whitman, I guess, with Longfellow, Longfellow as Stein was doing, it's sort of like Longfellow is writing these sentences that are, you know, poems that are objects, poems that are about something. And I'm really obsessed and taken with this notion that um, to for some for something to be identified as queer, it is pointless or meandering or digressive or whatever which is very uh, Whitmanian, obviously, as we all know. Um, but I guess in the super, but, you know, to contrast with Stein, it's like she was trying to, you know, she talked about roast beef for multiple lines until it just became like, what is this? What, what, what is she talking about? And I don't understand what this is. And it's this kind of obsession with, focusing on something until it just goes off the rails and reveals its own superabundance, um, which to me seems kind of like a Whitmanian move, you know, just a sort of, but women's doing something different. He's adding literally everything in and just sort of like cataloging in that way, as opposed to focusing on one thing. Um, and so I see that as a kind of lineage for these two queer writers, um, you know, who aren't necessarily talking well, it's not really an autobiographical point. It's more of a kind of theoretical, poetic sort of point, um, philosophical kind of point that I'm trying to make. I have a question for Karen, if if I might. Um, I, Karen, I'm I'm wondering what the next steps are in in remaking the reception of Whitman and and with greater attention to women. And you mentioned Sherry Seniza and her suggestion that people mine the notebooks and look at the names there and find out about those people. So is that the next step or are there other things that you that have occurred to you that could be done? Yeah, that was the list that I had at the end there, Ken. And it's tricky because the two objects that I'm showing you all um, were discovered kind of by accident. I think Ed Folsom was the one who first came across Don Osborne's daguerreotype. And then the the Katinka mystery has been batted around for a long time also. So finding instances of this, um, you know, as I called it, a groundswell history of uh, Leaves of Grass's reception by people who just weren't recorded in the media is a really difficult thing to trace. So I think it, it begins maybe by looking at the notebooks. I'm not sure if anybody's really examined those names very carefully. Mary, I know, and Catherine, ha, ha, Mary, I, I'm thinking about your essay on um, um, Beach and you know some of the other women that played a big part in um, Whitman's life around 1860. But I do feel like there's a greater story of Whitman's book as a woman's book that we have not yet really tapped. And an example, Mary, is your paper, right? Because you here you are telling us, okay, Whitman used Louisa May Cal Alcott as an indicator that, yeah, he could do this new step, this new type of writing. So again, that kind of situates him in a female literary tradition, right? Like often we say, oh, Fanny Fern's fresh fern leaves kind of gave him the 
the formula for the 1855 Leaves of Grass. But I was really interested by that, Mary, because that showed to me again that Whitman kind of looked very broadly around and often at a woman's history for the way in which he thought about writing. So, you know, just back to Ken's question, I just, you know, I looked at a lot of uh, Sherry's work. I just recently met her. She's such an amazing person. She's a Brooklynite, so she lives here in the city. And I feel like a lot of the work that she sort of like encouraged maybe hasn't yet been done. And I haven't done it either. I mean, you know, this paper is my first push to saying, maybe we need to look at every woman, not just the famous women. Um, you know, because we've given so much attention, good attention, like Gregory has and, and, you know, others have to the famous women, but there are other women who are also reading this, um, and it's a, impacting their lives as well. Ken has stepped out for a moment, but on the Whitman archive, the biography that he and Ed put up um, talks about how the imagery of Whitman with young men creates this iconography of queerness in the 19th century, and I'm thinking that your project would be very similar and, and maybe even the archive might have room for these images of people holding leaves of grass. I, I think this is something that readers would love to see. Um, Greg, I think your hand is up. Well, I wanted to uh, ask Mary a question about um, hospital sketches because the, I, I agree totally. The, um, the connection between Alcott's publication of hospital sketches and the influence on Whitman and his own Civil War writing seems pretty clear. You can map it out. But I, I, I remember that when he, he was pitching uh, his, his version of what became Memoranda to uh, Redpath, which was uh, Alcott's publisher. And when he did so, he said that it would be something considerably beyond mere hospital sketches. And th that line in the, in the letter always stuck with me because I, I can't decide is, and maybe it's both, right? But I can't decide, is it kind of just sexist di dismissing of women's writing um, that these were mere hospital sketches, but I will deliver the goods in terms of a really powerful account of what's happening inside the hospitals. Or was it to your to the point in your paper that they actually had, um, however similar they were in, in form, these um, catching glimpses of what's going on in the hospital um, and not trying to record the whole story, but just get the fragments down on paper. Um, they actually had very different approaches. I mean, with, um, uh, Alcott is comic, right? She's constantly making jokes about these really horrible things that are happening in the hospital, that because that's what she does. Um, whereas Whitman doesn't, right? You read Jump Taps and dude does not make jokes about what's going on at all. It's about sitting with other people in their pain and being there. And I wonder if that was it, that they that he said, okay, if we're gonna help people deal with the trauma of the war, we can't, no jokes. Well, it's a, it's a fascinating question and I think, um... It, it, it deserves a, a complicated and much longer answer. But um, I think Alcott was such a canny, under, she understood the audience in such a canny way that she brought the comedy in to draw them in. Whitman, on the other hand, um, wanted to catch this wave that he saw Alcott riding on, if I can use a surf metaphor. And he thought, he thought he could catch that wave and Redpath didn't just didn't have the money to get the, the work out in time. And that really disappointed Whitman, but it might ultimately have been better, better for uh, Whitman's uh, literary purposes. Um, and I think when that, that comment that you made about mere hospital sketches suggests that of course it was in his mind, um, but he wanted to just go beyond what he saw Alcott is doing, I don't think it was, in my view, I, I don't think it was a sexist dismissal. I think it was a way of marketing his project to Redpath, who then couldn't come through with marketing the project itself. Um, and that was greatly disappointing to Whitman. He really wanted to do that. Um, but it, like I said, I think it turned his attention to a different way of capturing the war ultimately than what Alcott did, so just a very short um, answer to a very complicated question. Thank you for that question, Greg. Uh, 
Um, but I, I did also want to ask Karen a question about the daguerreotype, because it seems to me that that woman who's holding up the 1856 edition of Leaves of Grass is signifying uh, a kind of counter discourse to the narrative of how women are um, portrayed. And because that is, as, as you rightly point out, um, speaking of Ed Folsom's characterization, the women's rights edition, it seems to me that what she's doing is very revolutionary uh, for her time. Um, and so, you know, it's a very interesting image that she's holding that 1856 edition. And I, I just wonder how she might have gotten a hold of it. And if she herself may have known Whitman, um, if there's any way we could dig that out to make that connection there, Karen. Yeah, well, thank you, Mary. And I guess this kind of goes back to Ken's question for me too, but there are no indicators on this daguerreotype no way that we can trace the daguerreotype to a studio. You know, the first guess of everyone, including Ed Folsom, was that it was a studio prop, uh, you know, and, and a lot of famous photographers kept books on the side for people to be taken with, um, uh, you know, in photographs. But this one is so obvious, and she's so obviously framing the title with her fingers. I, I have to agree you know, with Tim Pattison, who I, I corresponded with just on this photo alone, since he's an expert on this, he was really surprised by the photo. Because if you looked at the other examples I gave you, sure, you can see the binding, um, you know, some the there's the, the uh, daguerreotype of a man with the date etched on it, you know, 1854, which seems significant. But seeing an actual title is, is a very surprising thing, right? It's no mistake that she is associating herself with this book. And I think what's really interesting, Mary, is that daguerreotypes started going out of fashion around this time. So we know that the photograph was taken at that time, around 1856, 1857. Um, so she just, she must have gotten the book very quickly somehow. And I guess that brings me back to maybe trying to trace, because I know um, Ed has put up a, a kind of a, on, on the, um, on, I guess it's on the Whitman Quarterly website, the list of institutions and people that own the various copies of the 1855 edition of Leaves of Grass. What well, would be really interesting to see how the 1856 and the 1860 were distributed because there were many more copies of those and they must have gone out into the world because here we have a woman um, seemingly anonymous, right? Not very famous and wearing very conventional middle-class clothing. This is not a woman of money or of some kind of particularly remarkable fashion instinct. You know, she's just a regular gal wearing a really nice outfit, looks like a hair bracelet, um, those, those earrings look exotic, but they were actually period that was very fashionable at that time. Um, so almost everything is regular about her, except for that she's holding this book over her crotch and that she's not embarrassed to show that she doesn't have a wedding ring on. Um, so she's a mystery, right? But that points me to, well, maybe there are more of these out there or who else was reading this book that we don't know and has gone under the radar because they're just everyday people. Yeah, and Karen, what I really love about it too is that it predates that 1860 Leaves of Grass where Greg was talking about, you know, these are the clusters and one of them of course famously is Calamus and that's where we get most of the whoever you are holding me in hand. And this is often understood to be other queer men, but we have this woman holding him in hand in her crotch, and it really forces women into that idea of being the, the recipient of that you. Um, whoever you are, of course, includes them grammatically and in language, but the, the image does this as well. I really love it. And I think Catherine Brooks Yale, by putting that quote on the cover, which she must have gotten from the first edition, like within a few months of reading it, before Fanny Fern puts it up into the ledger, um, it's just a sign that women were actually out there reading the book. Catherine, I, I wanted to ask Greg a question though. Greg, I very much enjoyed your paper. And um, just because I've recently taught Emma Lazarus in the context of her being a Sephardic Jew. 
I wonder if you've done any um, a work on Ada Menken's cultural, Jewish cultural identity and her background and how she understood her Jewish cultural identity in the context of the 1850s. That's a fascinating time in American literary culture for um, the American Jewish um, population. The, uh, uh, the question I asked you was way simpler than this one. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, those of you who know about Mencken, um, it, it's complicated. There's no evidence that she um, was born Jewish. Um, there, I mean, there are accounts, but the accounts are unreliable. Um, she seems to have adopted a Jewish identity uh, in the in the eight, 1850s when she married um, her first husband, uh, uh, whose last name was Minken, uh, and she kept it. Um, and she embraced it, right? And she started publishing poetry in a Jewish voice. Um, she clearly interacted with other members of Jewish communities as if she were Jewish. But uh, the um, we don't know why. I like it's it's hard to tell why did she um, do this um, and. But she never, the other, on the other hand, she lived it. She, she embraced the identity. She changed her name. Um, she never, it wasn't a temporary identity that she used as a mask or a, um, uh, a phase. Um, but instead, for the rest of her, her life, she lived as if she were Jewish. Though, again, it seems to have started in the middle of the 1850s. Uh, when she got married, and um, there doesn't seem to be, there's no evidence of a conversion process, and there's no, and it's unlikely that she was born Jewish. So uh, a number of the the poets on my um, on my map, uh, I wonder, like, should I put this person up there? Okay, they had a Jewish dad. Does that make them a Jewish writer? And I think uh, Minken makes this even more complicated, right? Does Minken count as Jewish just because she said she was Jewish? I don't know. Okay, everyone, we are out of time.